Uh, I get to present to you uh, our kind of uh, first uh, uh, whole case study. So this is an interesting um, example of how you can use uh, the platform and the uh, tools that we provide um, here at Broad to reproduce um, uh, uh, published results and also how you can sometimes add additional layers of analysis uh, using just uh, what's available online. So uh, we're, we're actually going to start by cloning the workspace, and then I'll go uh, back to some slides so that I can give you context for what the study is about. Um, in the meantime, if everyone can please go to the Terra library, so click on the hamburger menu, go to the Terra library and to the showcase section, and then find the featured workspace on the right called the Reproducibility Case Study, Tetralogy of Fallot. It's over here somewhere. Here it is, Reproducibility Case Study, Tetralogy of Fallot. Um, I guess I'll just take, I'll take two minutes to go over the whole cloning thing again, just to get everybody very comfortable with it. So right now I am inside of So right now, uh, you should be inside of a public version of this um, uh, uh, workspace. So your access level should not be owner. Uh, you should only be able to read. If you want to uh, find out, um, I'm sorry, if you want to clone your own copy, then you click on this button and click clone. And then you will create your own copy wherever you want. So I already have a couple of copies called copies. So I'm calling this one copy, copy. Copy, copy. Roger, Roger. What's wrong? Oh, yeah. Oh, I've already called something copy, copy. So, copy, copy, copy. There you go. Although, I do like to point out the usefulness of this feature that you can just make as many copies as you want. A very nice part of the platform. Um, so here I am now in my own copy, and if you've done that, then now you should have an access level of uh, project owner. You can also tell who else is, um, uh, uh, um, who else has some sort of access to the workspace by clicking on the share icon. So if you're not an owner, then this will be blanked out. You won't be able to click on it. So when you're in just the public version, you can't share it. You can clone yourself uh, an individual copy, and then you can share copies of your clone. Uh, and the way that you would share it with individuals is to put in their email and decide what type of role they should have. So if they're a reader, then they can only read. If they're a writer, then they can edit and uh, use uh, compute power. So you can also click these check marks for more fine-tuned control. And of course, you can just make someone an owner which will give them the exact same level of access as you. They'll be able to then share with others. Um, so that's how you would do it with individuals. Um, you can obviously add lots and lots of users over and over. Uh, if you wanted to share it with a large group from the get-go, that's when you would use the authorization domain. So rather than add each member of your group individually, if you're already on Terra and you already have uh, a group, aka an authorization domain, in which all of the users for that particular project are already there, and you can just add them into the uh, authorization domain when you're cloning it, and then they will automatically all be in there. So hopefully that uh, clarifies um, the uh, ownership a little bit. Um, and then I want to go ahead and launch our notebook so that it's ready for a ready for us when we get there. So is everybody, is everybody following along so far? Everyone should hopefully be at this stage where they are trying to spin up uh, a cluster. It should have gone a little bit faster for me because I already have clusters open. Um, OK, so we'll just leave that like that for now. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of context for this uh, collaboration. It was really a collaboration uh, that we did with um, a researcher from uh, Chile named uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Mayasek. And um, 
so first I'll give you a little bit of the history of how the collaboration came about. I think that uh, really explains how these types of uh, projects are facilitated just by having this as a tool. So uh, the way this uh, came about is uh, uh, about a year or so, I guess, a year and a half uh, ago, we were applying uh, to do a workshop similar to this one uh, in Chile. And it just so happened that uh, at the same time, uh, Dr. Majasek was also applying to the same uh, workshop. He wanted to do uh, some sessions at the same workshop. Um, and we sort of connected over the fact that uh, we actually had very similar goals. So uh, Dr. Majasek had recently published uh, a paper on uh, the um, uh, uh, genetic uh, loci associated with uh, Tetralogia fallow, which is a common birth defect. Um, and his goal was to create a workshop session where people would learn how to reproduce his results. Um, and part of the reason that he wanted people to be able to reproduce uh, his results from a bioinformatic standpoint is that uh, one of the central claims in his paper was that sampling was a huge issue for proving that this particular genetic uh, locus was important for this um, congenital defect. Um, so uh, there was a lot of uh, circumstantial evidence, an anecdotal evidence prior uh, to the publication um, of his paper. And they did a bunch of uh, research where they collected a much larger cohort than it, uh, anyone had done before for this particular type of um, study. And they were able to prove uh, statistically that this was, in fact, the uh, locus for this um, uh, mutation. And uh, we wanted, so our goal for the uh, workshop was to show people how to do reproducibility on Terra in general. And so it worked out very well. We kind of came together and we said, well, why don't we try to reproduce your results? And then we kind of make this project together. Um, and it, was, it worked out very well. It was uh, very interesting, especially because we were able to go the extra level. Um, on top of reproducing his results, we actually were able to show that his results would only be reproduced once the sample size was large enough. So we actually did the same toy experiment two different ways with two synthetic data sets. One was smaller than the other. And that was the only difference. And the larger data set yielded the results that they published. So it would have actually been amazing if we had done this before the publication, because that would easily have been included, that could easily have been included um, in, the, in the paper. So. That's the kind of the overall background for uh, the project. I'll talk a little bit about uh, our approach, um, which is outlined uh, in general in this book, if uh, anybody's interested. The book is called The Practice of Reproducible Research by Justin Kitzes. Um, and the, uh, um, the bulk of uh, what it suggests is uh, contained in, the, in this first bullet point. So uh, you want to. Uh, pre-process a synthetic data set that is statistically identical in every way to the real data set, but with some sort of uh, randomized aspect. So you want to spike in a synthetic mutation. So you want to take a uh, data set of, uh, you know, ideally a large cohort of participants, something like 100 or 500 people. Um, and then you want to synthetically spike in a mutation, which is the mutation that uh, you're hypothesizing is uh, 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 the one that's connected to the um, defect that you're trying to correlate it with. And if you can prove that, um, if you can prove that uh, the uh, synthetic data set will give you the same results as the real data set, then uh, you've essentially validated your tool. It's like a benchmark for the entire pipeline. So if you can create a synthetic data set and get the exact same result on the back end, then you've benchmarked your entire results. Um, and you should be very happy if it works. Um, so the first step is to create the synthetic uh, data set. And the second step is to 
um, implement an analysis that is as uh, close to what the original analysis was. So in our case, this meant looking at the, um, the tools that they used for uh, doing the uh, alignment and um, uh, uh, haplotype calling and then using our own equivalents in place. <clears throat> so I'll just direct you guys to uh, this slide if you want to learn more about these uh, two uh, tools um, in more detail. So uh, the NEAT kit uh, reproduces the statistical properties of an original data set. So you first gather up a cohort, but for the sake of uh, synthetic data, you don't want to use an actual cohort. You don't want to use actual people's information. So you gather up uh, a cohort from publicly available data and you pass it through uh, this NEAT kit and it puts out on the other end a data set that has the same uh, statistical properties but is effectively de-identified in every other way. And then the BAM surgeon uh, directly uh, spikes in the mutations that you would be expecting. Oops. So really the hands-on portion of this session is just going to be us looking at first the, uh, uh, the tools um, in the workflow section. So there's six um, steps in the uh, pipeline and the first three are the ones concerned with generating the synthetic data and then the next three are the ones that are supposed to be the equivalent of what uh, Dr. Mayasek did. And um, <clears throat> so in the hands-on uh, session I'll show you how to launch at least one of these. That might be all that we have time for and we'll also uh, uh, use the Jupyter Notebook that we just launched to actually take a look at some of our results. Um, so again, for your edification, this slide contains the reference to the actual paper. So if you're curious about learning uh, their, their exact analysis, I encourage you to go and read it and cite it, obviously. Um, but in general, uh, uh, their um, conclusion was that uh, this notch one uh, 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 gene is a locus for uh, genetic variants that are a major contributor to specifically non-syndromic tetralogy of fellow. And so the whole non-syndromic thing was a, an important part of their motivation because it uh, speaks to the importance of the whole sampling question. Uh, when, they, when they specifically wanted to uh, connect the incidence of this um, uh, uh, heart defect to a genetic locus, they wanted to disassociate it from all of the previous known loci that um, are already known to be associated with uh, tetralogy of Philip. And so there are a few other um, syndromes that are associated with tetralogy of Philip. For example, uh, Down syndrome is uh, uh, very commonly associated with tetralogy of fellow, and they were particularly interested in proving uh, uh, that there were other specific loci other than the ones that are already known. So I think it's useful to understand exactly what tetralogy of fellow is. I'll try to spend less than like 60 seconds on that, but just out of curiosity, does anyone know what the tetralogy of fellow is exactly? Is anyone familiar with that? So it's uh, essentially, I think, the most common uh, a congenital heart defect. Um, it's obviously uh, very uh, dangerous. Um, and uh, the other issue with it is, is it's a very kind of subtle medical condition. Um, unlike with a genetic uh, condition like, for example, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta, where uh, a single error in, uh, in uh, a certain gene will cause a certain protein to just never be correctly made, then you know, well, this gene has an error in it, so that protein's never going to be correctly produced, so this person is going to be very sick all their life. With tetralogy of Fallot, um, the problem is a little bit more subtle. It's actually, it's a tetralogy, so it's actually uh, this combination of four physical symptoms, and they're really just these subtle physical deformations in the heart, so there's a uh, uh, pulmonary outflow tract obstruction. You can see over here, this is, this is the sick heart, this is the normal heart. So we have an obstruction, we have a ventricular uh, defect, so a hole in, uh, in the wall between these two ventricles. 
Um, we have, I'm sorry, between the two chambers, and then we have a, a toughening of this uh, 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 right ventricle over here. And it's kind of hard to tell why a person gets tetralogy at Fallot uh, on, a, on a basic level. There's some sort of very subtle uh, interaction between the uh, genetic code that forms the heart. So it's a question of does this person have a genetic defect that will lead them to have a weakened uh, 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 wall in between these two chambers that then leads to the uh, uh, heart muscle uh, having to overwork itself and then it leads to this uh, ventricular hypertrophy. It's kind of very hard to figure out exactly what it might be from. Uh, it's obviously going to be actually a statistical ensemble of things. <clears throat> This is especially true uh, in light of the fact that there are all of these anecdotal uh, 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 evidences, or there were all these uh, anecdotal evidences for uh, the correlation of Notch 1 and uh, Tetralogy of Philo, but they were only anecdotal. Nobody could prove them uh, 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 robustly with statistics um, until Dr. Mansick came along, and he, uh, so their group, did this very, very large study where they uh, combed through about 2,000 individuals. They had uh, this very, very large uh, panel of, of normal samples, so 1,200 uh, normals. And then even for the uh, patients with Tetralogy of Fallot, they threw out all of the syndromic Tetralogy of Fallot patients. So they got rid of anybody who had Tetralogy of Fallot for a known reason, like having Down syndrome or having this uh, other already known uh, 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 common deletion, this 2Q11.2 deletion. <clears throat> so that's what they did, and they were able to uh, get this correlation. And so we wanted to be able to do the same thing, and this slide just kind of shows how our method lines up with theirs. So you can see, there's the pointer. So along here is what they did, and along and at the bottom is the equivalent that we chose. And so that's the end of the slideshow. Then we'll go back to uh, the actual um, platform view. Uh, but overall, hopefully now you understand that the uh, point of this case study was to show that you can do, uh, uh, you can reproduce, first of all, you can reproduce a result all the way through and get exactly what uh, the uh, uh, peer-reviewed journal published. Uh, you can also collaborate a lot. So this whole project was done very collaboratively between our team and Dr. Marisek, who provided, obviously, a lot of information uh, for us to get started, but then also we were very, it was very easy to share with him what we were doing as we were, as we were um, completing the project. And finally, that you can actually produce interesting model results that are on top of the information um, that, was already, that was already in the uh, project. Um, so that, by the way, is the contact information for Dr. Marisek, if anyone's curious. And, oh, I have to press escape to get out of this. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, can I ask at this stage, is everybody's notebook actually running? Yes? Does anybody have a notebook that's not running yet? If you do, just raise your hand and the TA will come over and assist you. Um, so that's fine. The TA can, or I'm sorry, the uh, uh, notebook can keep running. Uh, in the meantime, I do want to go back to the data tab very quickly just to show you something about it. So we should go back to the workspace itself and go to the data tab. I'll wait for a second to see if everybody, does that make sense? Everybody following along is in the same place? I'll take that as yes. <clears throat> so 
So uh, here in the uh, data section is where you put in the uh, data models, which um, I mentioned uh, earlier, and I said that we would talk about it in a little bit more detail. So here it is. Uh, data models are essentially, uh, um, so it's a term that we came up with, just like the workspace. So the data model is something that's inherent to uh, the Terra uh, application. And uh, we support three different data models, which is to say three different formats that are specific to uh, whatever type of research you're interested in. Those three um, data models, those three formats are participants, so that's individual participant. So this represents one of those data models. So here we have a uh, tab separated value spreadsheet uh, of individual participants. The second data model type is called a participant set. Should be fairly uh, self-explanatory how those relate to each other. But uh, you'll see when we uh, launch a workflow that um, depending on the type of workflow you launch, sometimes what you do is generate a participant set from doing things to individual participants. Um, and then the third data model, which uh, uh, we won't uh, show you an example of today, is the tumor normal pair set. So that's for uh, specifically for cancer research, obviously, when you need to compare normal tissue with um, cancerous tissue. Um, and just to be perfectly clear about what I mean when I say that these are formats for the data, so here I'm going to download the spreadsheet and open it up. Oh, no, I want to open it in a... I do this. How do I left click on this laptop? Bottom right corner. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, so I want to open this with fetching. Is that just going to stay like that? I want to open it with a Microsoft Excel, or you know, I want to open it as a spreadsheet. All right, this is my computer. We do not use Windows. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is Snazzy. Thank you. So. The format is really just the uh, format that the spreadsheet takes. And the thing that I want to draw everybody's attention to is just this field right here, this top left corner. Uh, it says uh, entity participant ID. So that's the thing that tells you that the data model here is individual participants. Um, and it's very important that that cell has that exact, those exact characters, the entity colon participant underscore ID if you don't have that as the head of the column, then you'll get an error when you actually try to uh, uh, launch something against it. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the entity here would be different depending on what the data model is. And you can also uh, tell what type of uh, data model the tool that you're trying to launch is expecting by looking at the inputs of the workflows themselves. So hopefully everybody's uh, still following along. So I'm going, I went to my workflows section and I'm clicking on that first workflow. The step one, collect 1,000, uh, collect these 1,000 G participants. Um, so we're going to select a small amount of participants to do uh, this to so that we can maybe even uh, get a nice green check mark very quickly. Um, but before we do, I'll just point out what I meant. Yes, right here. So here you can see that one of the inputs that it expects is a, uh, a string type variable with participant ID as the entity type. So this is one way that you would be able to tell, for example, if you got to this stage and you wanted to select 
some data and you were like, wait, do I need to run this on a participant or a participant set? One of the ways to figure it out, obviously the first thing you should do is go to the dashboard and read the instructions. And if the dashboard isn't that helpful, then you can come here and figure out what inputs and outputs are expected. So we're going to select participant. I'm going to choose specific rows. I'm going to click just the top two. Um, actually, before I do that, you guys don't have to follow me along. I just want to point something out. Right now, there is a participant set, but only one. There's this participant set. It's called test cohort A100. When I launch this workflow, and everybody is welcome to do it along with me, so we select what we want, we click OK. Before we hit Run Analysis, let's look at our outputs. Uh, we notice that the attributes are empty right now. I'm just going to click Use Default. Save. Uh, how do you know uh, all of the things that you can input in there? Like there are lots of places that you can change things. How do you know what you have to put in? How do you know what you have to put in into the, into the data section? No, no, sorry. It's like in the input section here. Right under the attributes column, there are, you could change 15 things. Yeah. How do you know which ones you need to change in order to have this run properly? Well, with featured workspaces, you shouldn't need to change it. Like, this is, this is how it should be, and we should be providing it in a functional way. And if you're trying to create something from scratch, then I would say kind of one by one, right? Line by line, if you can, does that make sense? And if you have a featured thing, a featured workspace that you wanted to, say, change one, yours was slightly different than whatever the feature was. You could change some of these parameters and that would allow you to run it custom, more custom. Yeah, once you clone your own copy, you can do whatever you want to. Yeah. I will, I just wanted to point out, um, the places where it says workspace dot or this dot, um, it does autocomplete to tell you what options you have available in your tables uh, to give you some information about the data tab, which is what it's referencing. Um, but it, in general, you kind of set up this uh, input script once, and then you can rerun your workflows as many times as you want on multiple different samples or things like that. Or if you need to run it in multiple different ways, you can create different method configurations, which is what this is. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to hit Run Analysis, Launch. And our jobs are officially queued, so we are on our way. Let's see if they immediately switch to submit it. Sometimes it happens very quickly. No, not quite. Um, so if I go over to the data tab, now you notice there's a new participant set. And specifically, it is this set that has just these two items. These were the ones that we checked. So very convenient. And if we want to check uh, how our job is going, we go to the Job History tab. Look, we've changed over from queued to submitted. Wonderful. So let's go back to our notebook. And I'll just open the notebook again. And um, now we're going to uh, use the notebook to, do, to sort of interactively look uh, at the downstream clustering analysis. So it's probably useful to point out that all of the uh, uh, processing has already been done. So even though we didn't run all of the, even though you didn't run every single tool in your clone, uh, your clone has taken all of the things that we've already put into the featured version. So you are, everything's already finished. Um, so this, this notebook is actually uh, uh, interacting with like the completed process data. Um, so we can go through these one by one. And for the most part, 
this is a very simple um, this is a very simple to use uh, notebook. You really just want to make sure that everything is properly installed, no errors. One thing that it's useful to point out is that I'm waiting for us to see like a pink warning sign that isn't actually bad. So a lot of people get worried when they see pink or yellow uh, uh, text, um, especially if it says warning, well, which sometimes it will actually say warning. Don't worry about that. Um, just because it says, just because it gives you some sort of warning does not mean that it did not successfully uh, compile that cell. Um, if it didn't, it should give you a, an error message that specifically says what the error must have been. I like to go through these like this just to make sure that none of them are. So you don't do just a run all? I will do a run all. I like to do this the first time just to make sure, just to see. You know, if I just hit run all, then I'll end up kind of scrolling through to figure out where it looked like things went badly. So a lot of times, the first time that I run through a notebook, I'll just So could you explain again what this particular notebook is doing related to the study? So this notebook actually uh, queries the downstream analysis all the way at the end. So here, we'll just go all the way to the end where they are able, oh wait, I'm sorry. Did I already change this to be a, ah yes. So I think in the uh, example, uh, in the uh, featured workspace that you guys all cloned just now, in this section, 3.2.1, uh, uh, you should have a test cohort A100. Is that, is that correct? Or does everyone have uh, test cohort A500 already? Oh, so you already have test cohort A500? So uh, typically we think that it's more interesting to start with the A100, so that's the smaller cohort where we generate a, a, a smaller uh, synthetic data set. And now I am gonna do the whole run all thing, right? So I went all the way to the bottom, I saw that I generated the visualizations, there was no error, the visualizations didn't just have zeros everywhere, so I know everything's working. Um, and then I decided, oh wait, I had the wrong, I was looking at the wrong output file. Let me go back, just like what actually happened. Um, and change it to the one that I want to. So I'm changing it to A100. I'm gonna click just above it so that I can go to cell and run all below. This is gonna take a moment. And so with a 100 uh, uh, participant cohort, we find that the notch one gene is not at the top of the list. So that's really the entire thing that we're looking at with this uh, notebook is uh, uh, where, where the uh, correlation actually falls. Uh, however, when we, you can, you can look at the bar graph. So here we have notch one in a clear second place position. Not what Dr. Myasek proved. So if we were to do this exact same study with 500 and 1,000 and 5,000 people, and it would still not show what Dr. Myasek showed, then that would be evidence that his pipeline was perhaps malfunctioning. Um, but instead, we get to run all of these and Why didn't that change? Did I not change this to, oh, I didn't change that to 500. There we go, so now our result is significantly different and now notch one is head and shoulders above the competition. 
So congratulations, you've reproduced the critical cluster analysis at the heart of this tetralogy of Fallot paper. Um, so hopefully this gives you kind of an idea of uh, the level of creativity that um, you can have in this, in this giant sandbox that uh, we're providing, where you can reproduce results, you can mix and match uh, analyses to figure out if uh, there's some sort of a subtle fact that's uh, escaping um, the researchers. Um, and uh, in general, you can just play around with all of these amazing uh, tools in a very user-friendly manner. So it's much more enjoyable, if you ask me, to uh, be doing this kind of work inside of uh, uh, an environment like this, where when you want to create a new notebook, for example, you just create a new notebook and it launches your notebook. If you want to uh, import uh, workflows from other places, the way you would do that is to, so let's say we wanted to go to, let's say we wanted another notebook to be in that same workspace. So now I'm going to find our notebooks playground. So here we have a, um, this is our featured workspace that contains just a slew of useful notebooks, different, um, different instructional notebooks, how to use a cohort. Um, there are uh, notebooks here in both R and Python. So everybody's very uh, welcome to come look uh, and play around in this uh, workspace. And if you want to send a notebook into a particular workspace, all you have to do is click the three dots, copy to another workspace, and select the destination. Copy, 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 copy. All right, I would send it there. And then it actually gives me a button to go automatically there and it'll take me right there. So there, I put that notebook in. And the same thing applies to the tools that are contained inside of these, the workflows themselves. So we could, for example, take this go. So here we have, let's say I wanted to compare this haplotype caller to the one. Now, now I have seven of these in here. I have, I have now a second one of these. Um, so yeah, this was kind of a case that, I'm sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, I just sort of have a question. So yeah. Essentially, workflows are tools that allow you to get the data to where you want it. And then the notebook is what you do to analyze. You still sort of analyze the data and make figures. Yeah. That's the way this interact. Yeah, so. It's summer. Uh, so uh, the way I like to think of it is that workflows perform these automated repetitive tasks over and over and over again. So anything you need to standardize and do the same way every time, do it that with the workflow. Um, but then notebooks itself is an interactive analysis. So you can interact with the data, open it up, see various graphs that we've created. You can create graphs for your papers, things like that. Um, but those are the two main differences. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, for somebody who like, doesn't actually code in Python or R, sure. like that's essentially you're using coding to create figures and do analysis in notebooks. Mm -hmm. And you're using tools in the workflow to, mm -hmm. to get the data to a point where you can do analysis. Yes. Makes sense. Go ahead. Yeah, so workflows are on the VM and we have off. Is that how it works? No, I have to. Do you want to take this or? Um, hold on. There is, there's a really nice graphic that shows, that shows it, but I don't have it in one of my slides. The graphic that actually shows that um, when you launch a workflow, um, that uh, uh, causes uh, the Cromwell engine to then um, connect to the, uh, uh, the Google API. 
So do you have to have a, do you have to have um, a machine running if you want to run a workflow, or do you have that machine? Yeah. And, yes. and is there a way to like scale up? You know, say you want to run like faster, can you control that? To run the workflows faster, to run notebooks. The workflows faster. So one thing I'd love for you to pull up is, could you open up any one of those workflows and look at the Whittle? So there's a section within the Whittle script. If you scroll down to a task, um, a bit more into runtime, the runtime section. Scroll a bit further. Those are parameters, this one. Oh. Yeah. Um, so this is the runtime section where Essentially, for a notebook, you were presented with that little GUI of how much disk space, how much memory, and all that you need. Um, so you can scale up with a notebook by adjusting those parameters. This is where you adjust those parameters for a whittle, and it's per task. So anytime you start off a workflow, you are running a series of tasks, and each task spins up a virtual machine uh, inside Google. It's not an interactive one like notebooks, but it just spins it up for your purposes. And it will run with a certain Docker image, which has all your programs installed. It has a certain amount of memory in gigabytes and a certain amount of disk space to use. Uh, so we have it all parameterized. Uh, this is a fairly complex workflow, so it's not the easiest to look at. Um, but essentially, you're able to easily adjust it using the, that method configuration section that you're able to see in Terra. Um, so if you decide, I need to have more memory now uh, for this particular task because it runs really long or it uses a big file, um, you can always upgrade it. And can you adjust the number of CPUs too, or is that? I believe so. Yeah. Yes, I'm seeing, yes. Okay. So that, to your question, like the, if you just go onto your workspace and you go up to that little weather notebook runtime, is that, and you do, you go to your profile and say high computing power. That mm -hmm. doesn't increase your power to run workflow? Not at no. all. No. Yeah, it's a separate environment. Yeah. So the workflows the and the space. notebook are separate environments. Okay, so the, great. So the workflow is inside of the workspace. Correct. Yes. The notebook is inside of the workspace. Yes. yes. But the only thing you have the ability to control with that runtime is the notebook. The So in terms of what you can control with the user interface of Terra, yes. The runtime, this is the one that we have the simple buttons for. If you want to control stuff like that for the workflows, you have to edit the Whittle script. Well, not necessarily. Oh, if there's... you cancel that and go to the inputs section, that's oh, yes, where you'd that's... edit it here. Um, the only one we're exposing, I think, is the preemptible tries and the Docker image, um, because for this particular one, we don't want you editing it. Um, but you can expose other parameters like yeah, that. Yeah, I could imagine that mm -hmm. you would actually want to, I don't know how many times you need to increase the notebook power, but mm -hmm. certainly I think we'd probably want to increase the work. Well, power yeah. if you're running a bunch of, so you have 100 files that you're trying to process out yeah. and you want to get it done within a day. Yeah, so a bit about how workflow's done, and I wish I had a output diagram to look at. Do we have any of those? No? Um, Basically, when a workflow runs, it let's say you run it on 100 samples, it'll launch 100 workflows so at, the at the same time. So one sample will be running uh, on its own VM, doing its own compute with its own things. And the reason why we don't have the ability to adjust the number of CPUs and things like that is because within the script itself, and the part of the reason why it looks so complicated, was we're taking in what's the size of the file and then we're using a calculation to determine how much space we need on the disk. Um, that's how we've done it in this script. And you can absolutely feel free to reuse that code in your own scripts. <laughs> uh, we recommend it. Um, and you'll be able to help with that. Anything else? Yeah. I have a question. This is sure. very specialized, but um, are you familiar with GTEx? No. I know the name. Okay. I haven't worked with it. Well, I we have some <coughs> data, and GTEx is a lot of our seek data, mm -hmm. and some and somebody had the good idea. Oh, why don't we um, process our data with the exact same software that and pipeline that processes the GTEx data? 
and then they'll be more comparable than if you didn't do that. And so my question is, do you have like, the, the pipelines that GTEx used? What are they called? We can search for them right now. Yeah. I don't know what they're called. GT. We can search for GTEx literally. Oh, in, in our the workflows um, page. So if you go over to, here. Uh, yep. Yeah, incidentally, this is where you can search oh, for individual workflows. If you go to your workspaces uh, in the menu, your workspaces, then you can access all the public ones. I warn you that I'm frozen. It's frozen. it <laughs> loads really slow for me because I have access to thousands of workspaces because I used to help uh, diagnose issues, so people share their workspaces with me. Sorry, what do you want? Um, you want if you tick the show public workspaces box, You'll be able to see anything that's publicly available, and then search GTEx, G-T-E-X. We'll see if there's anything in there. So it looks like there's a few. Um, we have a Bro GTEx RNA Seq workflow. Does that make is that it? Okay. Sorry, which? Uh, the top right. The top right. This yeah. Right here. Yeah. So there's right there, a lot right. of workflows available on Terra. We've run you through some sample ones today, um, but absolutely look for things that would apply, apply to your use case. Um, it might already be there. Any further questions? All right, I have a couple things to show, unless you have more. Yep, no, okay. please. So, um, a lot of you have been asking questions today, and some of these questions I may not have been able to answer perfectly. Um, but I wanted to show you a way you can get in touch with us. Um, if you have questions today I was unable to answer, or if you have uh, questions in the future and want to be able to contact us, um, up in the hamburger menu, you'll see this Terra support button. If you expand it, we have a whole bunch of resources for you. Um, and the one to contact us is this contact us button. And if you go ahead and click it, it'll pop up a little widget on your screen, which I need to zoom out to see because I'm so zoomed in. Um, and basically just say things you're interested in. It'll give you the opportunity to attach files if you're having trouble with your workspace or something like that. Um, or if you encounter a bug, you can report that. Or if you have a particular feature request, um, you can absolutely reach out to us with that. You'll notice up here it's beta. Our Terra product is still in beta, so we are actively developing it um, and will continue to be for quite a while. And folks like William are there to help you, are, are there to prioritize what sort of requests you guys have for the platform, what you'd like the platform to do or to look like, things like that. So that's the contact us button. Uh, and that sends a ticket into our system and then um, Sushma responds to most of those there, um, but she'll be able to connect you to the right people if we need uh, additional expertise. Um, another thing to point out in the Terra support button here is this uh, request a feature button. So let's say you didn't want to just send us a ticket, you can actually go into our feature requests page and create a new feature request. Um, I really recommend you guys check this page out because there are a lot of um, requests in here that you might also be interested in. And if you go into it, you might want to upvote it so that we know um, more people are interested in this particular feature. Um, that really helps us out uh, to know exactly what you guys are looking for uh, in the product. Another thing to point out uh, is, if I go back here, uh, the next two links here are how-to guides and the community forum. Uh, the community forum is a place you can go to ask each other questions um, or just post things that are of interest to you, but I wanted to point out this how-to guides section. Um, we were able to give you a pretty big overview of Terra with these presentations and with these hands-ons, but uh, additional things that maybe of interest to you are uh, these articles that have been written. So earlier today, I believe I linked you a document on billing, which should be in here. I don't know where the billing documents are, actually. 
Um, but we have a variety of resources here that can help you um, understand. Quick start? This is getting started? Oh, right. There it is. Uh, anyways, you can find the billing links here um, that I linked in those slides, or you can just read them straight from uh, this website here. If you happen to lose the PowerPoint, you always have a link to this uh, knowledge base to give you more information about um, various things that are available to you on the platform. Um, Another interesting thing to note is that if I go back to the top level here, we have this release notes section. I will tell you there's a release going out immediately after this workshop. So we're always releasing new features, new improvements, things like that. And you can check what's new in the platform by reading these release notes. Uh, so for example, earlier uh, this week, uh, we made GTEx V8 available, which is a data set. I'm not super sure what it is, but. <laughs> There it is for you. Um, so you can access it uh, via this link here. Kate, can I make a quick plug? Sure. Um, if you click on release notes, um, there's a, a way to follow the section. Um, so you can click follow, and then you'll get emails whenever we post some release notes. Um, there's also a service notification section, too. So if we have scheduled maintenance, so the system might be down in a week or, or not. In like a week, we'll warn you for the, the time that it's going to be down. Um, that's the first place we post stuff. So um, I encourage people to follow that. Um, they want to get email notifications. Thank you. Um, all right. If I go back to Terra proper, I think I walked you through this entire thing. Um, another thing to note uh, is that your name here also expands and there's a bunch of information about uh, billing, for example. So if you go over to billing, you'll be able to see your free credits account and uh, the stuff you're working on there or perhaps the workshop-temp account, which has quite a few people in there. I did also want to mention to those of you who are part of the workshop temp account uh, that it is temporary. It's designed to be used for this workshop. So in about a week, uh, you'll lose access to it. Um, but you can always um, work on any of these workspaces that we did today, uh, rerun them and things like that on a different building and project um, if you're interested in rerunning them. All the materials are designed to be run at home on your own as needed, uh, or you can share with a lab mate if they were unable to make this training. Um, speaking of which, I go to the showcase section. Um, we also, for any of you who are interested in uh, GATK, who use that toolkit, we've also developed a series of tutorial workspaces centered around that. Um, they're all starting with this uh, GATK tutorials uh, heading. Um, so we're constantly updating those. If you're interested, they're also designed to be run on their own. You can feel free to run through those. Um, I didn't actually ask today what uh, folks do for their research. Uh, so I'm not sure if any of you are GATK users or not, but. There it is. Question. So when was, how do you go back and find the GTEx RNC pipeline mm -hmm. work, or workspace sure. from here without going like into your personal account finding it? Yep. Um, so I just went up to the hamburger menu, yeah. and then all of you should have this Your Workspaces button, yeah. which shows to you all the workspaces available to you. So for me, it shows a lot more because I have a lot of access. But if I go in, and it's going to take me a little bit to load. And I tick this Show Public Workspaces button. It should show things that are available to you publicly, as well as privately. So if I type in GTEx here at the top, I can find it. If I type in RNA-seq, uh, we have a few for RNA-seq. Uh, there's a single cell RNA-seq one. Are these private? And I just have access? Yeah, I just have access. So 
So because this says best practices, it leads me to believe that we have a copy of it somewhere that we should make publicly available to you guys. Does anybody know? I mean, if not, I would check the method repository and see if you can find GTEx uh, workplace there. And then you can just put it into a workspace. In the, in the browser. Yeah, I would try that. So what she just mentioned was the method repository. If I go to Terra Library and click on workflows, uh, the method repository is linked over here. And those are trying to get migrated over? Is that what I mean? Yes. Okay. So these all exist in Terra. They're just, um, we don't have a nice UI for it yet, and we're working on that. I believe it's on this quarter's goals. Mm 